Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, IGCSE Drama Class of 2015 uh, Group Text Based Drama Showcase. Uh, for those of you who were here with us a couple, uh, maybe a two months ago, we had where we had our monologue showcase. Today is the second of three uh, a series of uh, drama showcases that um, these students are required to uh, have or to perform as part of their coursework requirements. Uh, one of the new things that um, CIE had informed us for this class is that all performance coursework will now be required to be performed in front of an audience. And that is why we are very thankful that you have come here tonight to join us and be our audience. Um, this is also a great event because not only is this the showcase for the drama students, but the year 12 IB Theater students have also been tasked to direct uh, some of the group scenes. And I will be informing you through the in introduction which scenes were directed by the year 12 class. So it was a, a joint project between the year 12 theater students and the year 11 IGCSE drama students. And so, um, before we begin, just a couple of things that we are requesting our audience. Number one, this is an official uh, coursework recording. This is part of their examination, and therefore, they will only be given one chance to do this. So to ensure that their performances are at the best quality that we can give, we are kindly requesting that, uh, that you have your phones or mobile, mobile phones uh, Turned off, please. Okay, can we, I'm kindly requesting you to do that right now. All other sound emitting devices are also requested uh, to be turned off or to be put on mute. And uh, I would very much appreciate if you do that right now. Also, uh, please refrain from moving around in the middle of a performance. If you really need to leave, it, um, there are pauses in between each um, excerpt and that's when you may be leaving. But please do not leave in the middle of a performance, especially if you're seated in the center, because our uh, cameras may be picking your movement up, and it may be distracting to the examiner uh, who's uh, going to be uh, moderating their performances. So aside from that, we should be ready. So we are now going to request house lights to turn off. And we will begin with our first piece. Our first piece tonight is a piece from the play called The Physicists. It is written by noted Swiss playwright Friedrich Durenmatt. Briefly, the play deals with questions of scientific ethics and humanity's ability to handle intellectual responsibilities. The play is set in a facility for mentally ill patients. And in this scene, we see Herbert Georg uh, Butler, a spy faking mental illness, who introduces himself to uh, Richard as Sir Isaac Newton. So here now are our candidates, Jason Chi and David Wang in The Physicists. Canada name Jason Shi Chuan Ming. I'm going to play the role of Sir Isaac Newton. Canada name David Wang. I'm playing the role of inspector from the scene in Physicist by Friedrich Dorman. Oh, Sir Isaac Newton, Inspector Richard Vox. I'm so glad, really very glad. Truly. And I heard a noise in here. Groans and gurglings. And then people coming and going. May I inquire just what has been going on? Nurse Stra was strangled. She was in the house with the other two patients. Anastia was one of them. Nurse Stra was the second nurse in three months to be murdered. Do do you mean the district champion of the National Judah Association? 
the district chant. She was such a strong, fit person, both physically and mentally. However, she was murdered this morning. Gruesome, by an earth hurric and nasty, that capable physicist and musician. Hey, listen, he's playing his fiddle now. He has to calm himself down. Yes, the tussle must have taken it out of him. He's rather highly strong, poor boy. How did he? With the cord of the table lamp, he pulled it as hard as he could and wrapped it around the nurse's neck. Yes, with the cord of the table lamp. That's another possibility. Poor Anasty. I'm sorry for him. Truly sorry. And I'm sorry for the lady student champion too. Now you have to excuse me. I must put things straight. Do. We've got everything we want. Can I give you a hand? You obviously know where everything belongs. I simply can't stand this order. Really, it was my last order that made me become a physicist to interpret the apparent disorder of nature in the light of more sublime order. Oh, will it disturb you if I smoke? <laughs> On the contrary, I was just thinking that a cigar would have a very calming influence. My morning's been really busy. Oh, excuse me, but we're just talk talking about the odor. So I must tell you, the patients are allowed to smoke here, but not the visitors. If they did, it would stink the place out. See. Will it disturb you if I have a nip of brandy? No, not at all. I often have a dash of brandy myself. But I know the patients are not allowed alcohol. That poor Anasty. I'm very upset. How on earth could anyone bring himself to strangle that nurse? I believe you strangled one yourself. Did I? Nurse Doris Stelmosa, another fit athlete. Oh, the lady wrestler on the 12th of August with a curtain cord. Yes. But that was something quite different, Inspector. I'm not mad, you know. Your health. And yours. Dorothea Mosa. Let me cast my mind back. Blonde hair. Enormously powerful. Yet. Despite her bulk, very flexible. She loved me and I loved her. It was a dilemma that could only be resolved by use of the curtain cup. <laughs> dilemma? How can any dilemma be so serious that it causes death? My mission is to devote myself to the power of gravitation, not the physical requirements of a woman. Quiet! Couldn't you do both? A balanced life is a healthy life. Yes, but this was this tremendous difference in our ages. <laughs> Granted, you must be well on the wrong side of 200, if not 300. How do you mean? Well, being Sir Isaac Newton, you have to be at least 200 years old. Are you out of your mind, Inspector, or are you just <laughs> having me on? <laughs> now look. I haven't time to play games. Who are you, actually? Do you really think I'm Sir Isaac Newton? Well, don't you? You talk as if, if you are he. Inspector, may I tell you a secret in confidence? Of course. I'm not Sir Isaac Newton. I only pretend to be Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> what for? Why would anyone pretend to be Sir Isaac Newton? So as not to confuse poor Anasty. I don't get it. You, well, unlike me, 
The nasty is really sick. <laughs> he thinks he's Albert Einstein. But what's that got to do with you? If the nasty were to find out that I am the real Albert Einstein, all he would be let loose. Do you mean to say you really think you are Albert Einstein? Yes, I do. I am the key, the celebrated physicist and the discoverer of the theory of relativity, born on the 14th of March, 1879, in the city of O. How do you do? Just call me Albert. And you can call me Richard. I could give you another Beethoven sonata with a more dear good dash than a nasty. The way he plays the andante, simply barbarous. Simply barbarous. <laughs> but I don't understand anything about music. I don't know the difference between a flat and a sharp. Let's sit down, shall we? Richard. Yes, Albert? You are cross, aren't you? Because you can't arrest me. But, Albert. Oh, is it because I strangled a nurse that you won't arrest me? Or is it because it's I who paved the way for the atomic bomb? But, Albert. When you switch by the door, what happens? The light goes on. I do that automatically without even thinking about it. You establish electrical contact with each other. Do you understand anything about electricity? I'm no physicist. I studied elementary science at school and left when I was 14. I don't understand much about it either. All I do is to elaborate a theory about it on the basis of natural observation. I write down some mathematical idiom and obtain several formulae. And then the engineers come along. They don't care about anything except the formula. They treat electricity like a pimp treats a whore. They simply exploit it. They build machines. And then machines can only work when it's become independent of the knowledge that led to its invention. So any fool nowadays can switch on a light or touch of an atomic bomb. And that's what you want to arrest me for, Richard. It's not fair. But I don't want to arrest you, Albert. I never mentioned the word arrest throughout our conversation. You are the one who raised the point. It's all because you think I'm mad. But if you don't understand anything about electricity, why don't you refuse to turn on the light? It's you who are the criminal, Richard. Oh. But I must put my brandy away. If Sister Bo come, there will be trouble. Well, goodbye. Bye, Albert. Oh, Richard, you are the one who should be arrested. Now, I will have my cigar. Thank you, Jason and David. Our second group um, will now play a scene from the play Head a Gabbler. Head a Gabbler is a play written by noted playwright Henrik Ibsen. It has gained recognition as a classic in realism in 19th, 19th century drama. In this scene, Hedda is the daughter of an aristocrat who returns from her honeymoon to a man she apparently does not love. We also see her schoolmate Thea who is a shy, nervous, and um, a shy, nervous girl married to Hedda's husband's academic rival. So here now are our candidates, Pu Yu Lee and Christy Pang, playing a scene from the play Hedda Gabler.
Candidate named Pancho Christie. Can I'm playing the role of Heather. Candidate named Pu Yu Li. I'm playing the role of Mrs. Elvis from the play Heather Gabler, written by Henrik Ibsen. There, we have killed two birds with one stone. What do you mean? Well, could you not see that I want him to go? Yes, to write the letter. And that I must speak to you alone. About the same thing? Well, precisely. But my dear Mrs. Tasman, there is nothing more, absolutely nothing. Oh yes, but there is. I can see that. Well, sit here. And we'll have a cozy confidential time. But my dear Mrs. Tasman, I was really on the point of going. Oh, you can't be in such a hurry. Well, tell me something about your life at home. Oh, that's what I care least to speak about. Well, but to me, dear, why weren't we schoolfellows? Yes, but you were in the class above me. Oh, how dreadfully I was afraid of you I was then. Afraid of me? Yes, dreadfully. For when we met on the stairs, you used to pull my hair. <laughs> Did I really? And once you even said you would burn it off oh, my head. That was all nonsense, of course. Oh, but I was so silly in those days, and since then, we have drifted so far, far apart from each other. Our circles have been so entirely different. Well then, we must try to drift together again. As in the old days, we say do to each other. And call each other by Christian names. No, I'm sure you must be mistaken. No, not at all. I can remember quite distinctly. Well, so now we're going to renew our old friendship. There now. And you shall say do to me and call me Heather. Oh, how good and kind you are. I'm not used to such kindness. Oh, there, there, there. And I shall say do to you and call you my dear Flora. Uh, my name is Thea. What? Of course, I mean, Thea. So, you're not accustomed to goodness and kindness, Thea. Not in your own home. Oh, if I only had a home, but I haven't any. I've never had a home. I don't quite remember. Was it not as housekeeper that you first went to Mr. Elvis? I really went as governess, but his wife, his late wife, was an invalid and rarely left her room. So I had to look after the housekeeping as well. Oh, and then you became mistress of the house. Yes, I did. Well, about how long ago was that? My marriage? Yes, five years ago. Oh, to be sure, it must be that. Oh, those five years. At all, at all events, the last two or three of them. If you could only imagine the... Thea. Yes, yes, I'll try. But if you could only imagine and understand. Well, Elliot Lovebark has been in your neighborhood about three years, hasn't he? Elliot Lovebark? Yes, he has. Well, had you known him before in town here? Scarcely at all. I mean, I knew him by name, of course. But you saw a good deal of him in the country. Yes, he came to us every day. He gave the children lessons, for in the long run, I couldn't manage it all myself. No, that's clear. And your husband? I suppose he's often away from home. Yes, being sheriff, you see. He has to travel a great deal in his district. Oh, my sweet poor Thea. You must tell me everything exactly at its extent. Well then, you must question me. Well, what sort of a man is your husband, Thea? I mean, in everyday life. Is he kind to you? I'm sure he means well in everything. Oh, I should think he must be altogether too old for you. There is at least 20 years difference between you and him, isn't it? Yes, that's true too. Everything about him is repellent to me. We have not a single thought in common. We have no single point of sympathy. He and I. Well, but is he not fond of you all the same, in his own way? Oh, I really don't know. I think he regards me simply as a useful property, for it doesn't cost much to keep me. I'm not expensive. Well, that is stupid of you. It cannot be otherwise, not with him. I don't think he really cares for anyone but himself, perhaps a little for the children. Well, and Ellert Lofbach? For Ellert Lofbach? I put that into your head. Well, my dear, 
I should say that when he sent you after him to town. And besides, you said so to yourself, the testament. Uh, did I? Uh, yes, I suppose I did. No, I may as well just make a clean breast of it at once, for it must all come out in any case. Well, why, my dear? To make a long story short, my husband did not know that I was coming. What? Your husband didn't know it? No, of course not. For the matter, he was away himself. He was traveling. Oh, I could bear it no longer, Heather. I could indeed so utterly alone as I have been in the future. Well, and then? So I put together some of my things, what I needed most, and as quietly as possible, and I left the house. Well, you saw the word? Yes, and took the train to town. Oh, why, my dear, my little Thea, to think of you daring to do that. What else could I possibly do? But what do you think your husband will say when you go home again? Back to him? Well, of course. I shall never go back to him again. So you have left your home for good and all? Yes, there was nothing else to be done. Well, but to take fight so openly. Hmm? Oh, it's impossible to keep things of that sort secret. But what do you think people will say of you, Thea? They may say what they like, for all I care. I've done nothing but what I had to do. So what are your plans now? What do you think of doing? I don't know yet, but I know this, that I must live here where Ellen Lovecourt is, if I am to live at all. But how did this, this friendship between you and Ellen Lovecourt has come about? Oh, it grew up gradually. I gained a sort of influence over him. He gave, up, he gave up his old habits, not because I asked him to, for I never dared to do that, but he saw how repulsive they were to me, and so he dropped them. <laughs> you have reclaimed him, as the saying goes, my little So he says himself, at any rate, he on his side has made a real human being of me, taught me to think and to understand so many things. Did he give you lessons to them? No, not exactly lessons, but he talked to me talked about such an infinity of things, and then came the lovely, happy time when I began to share in his work, when he allowed me to help him. He did, did he? Yes, he never wrote anything without my assistance. Well, you were too good comrades in that. Comrades, yes, Fancy Hatter, that is the very word he used. I ought to feel perfectly happy, but yet I cannot, for I don't know how long it will last. You're not sure of him than that? A woman's shadow stands between Ella Lovecourt and me. Well, who can that be? I don't know. Someone he knew in his past. Someone he has never been able to hold it again. Well, what did he say? He okay. said that when they parted, she threatened to shoot him with a pistol. <coughs> oh, that was all nonsense. No one does that sort of thing in town here. No, and that's why I think it must have been that red-headed singing woman. Won't you? Yes. Very likely. For, for, for I remember they say of her that she carried loaded firearms. Well, it must have been. And not just fancy, Heather. I hear that the singing woman, that she's in town again. Oh, I don't know where she. Here comes Tessman. Yeah, all this must remain between you and me. Yes, yes, for heaven's sake. Thank you, Puyu and Christy. Our third group is made up of Olina Zhu and Karen Yao, and they will be playing a scene from the Pulitzer Prize winning play, A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. This play is one of the most recognized plays in American theater. The play deals with the Southern Belle, Blanche Dubois, who clings to her Southern customs of decorum. She visits her sister, Stella Kowalski, who lives in the French Quarter of New Orleans. In this scene, we will see Blanche and Stella in an emotionally charged scene. This scene is directed by IB Theater student, Elijah Liao. So here now, let's give a big round of applause to Alina and Karen. Kenyan name, Yongming Xuan Karen. I'm playing the role of Blanche. Candidate named Zhu Chou Yu Olina, and I'm playing the role of Stella from a scene from the play A Streetcar Named Desire, written by Tennessee Williams. I don't see where I'm going to put me. 
Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to put you in there. What kind of bad this? One of those collapsible things? Well, how does it feel? Does it feel all right? Oh, mm, wonderful, honey. I don't like bad that gets much. But there's no dog in two rooms. And Stanley, will it be decent? Well, Stanley is Polish, you know. <laughs> there's something like Irish on there. Um, well. No, it's a highbrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I brought some nice clothes to make all your lovely friends in. Oh, I'm afraid. You won't think they're lovely at all, Blanche. What I like? They're Stanley's friends. Poland? <sighs> they're a mixed lot, Blanche. Hydrogenous types? Oh, yes. Yes, types is the right word. Well, anyhow, I brought some myself and I will welcome. I guess you're hoping I will say I will put up at a hotel. But I'm not going to put out at a hotel. I want to be near you. Got to be with someone. Because you must have noticed I'm not very well. Blanche, you seem a little nervous or overwrought or something. <sighs> Were Stanley like me? Or oh, oh. I just be a bit too long still? I can't stand that. You'll get along fine together. Well, that's only if you try not to compare him with the men that we used to go out with at home. Is he so different? He is a different species. In what way was he like? Oh, you can describe a man you're in love with, but here's a picture. An officer? A master sergeant, engineers and corps. Those are decorations. He had those sound white men, hey? Well, I assure you I wasn't just blinded by all the brass. That's not what I... But of course, there are things to adjust to myself later on. <sighs> you have told him I'm coming? Well, the thing is, Stanley, he doesn't know. You haven't told him? <sighs> He's on the road a good deal. It's okay. Oh, troubles. <sighs> yes. Yes. Oh, well, good. I mean... Isn't it? Blanche is not good. I can hardly stand it when he's away for even a night. Why, Stella? When he's away for a week, I nearly go wild. Gracious. Oh, but when he comes back, I cry on his lap like a baby. I guess that is what I mean by being in love. Stella, I haven't asked you since you probably said I was going to ask. So, I would expect you to be understand things what I had to tell you. What is it, Blanche? You're going to reproach me. You're bound to reproach me. But before you do, take into consideration. You left. I stay and struggle. You kept in your arms and love out for yourself. I stay and bear with and try to hold together. It doesn't mean any reproachful way, but all burning just to stand my shoulders. Well, Blanche, the best I could have done was make my own living. I know, I know, but you're the one that banned the burial. No, I, I stay and fall for it, play for it, I'm sorry for Stop it. Stop this hysterical outburst and just tell me what happened. What do you mean fought for it and blood for it? What kind of... Well, Stella, well, Stella, and now I'll take this attitude about this. About what? Please! The loss. The loss. Loss. Bell Reef. Loss! Is it? No. Yes, Stella. But, but what happened, Blanche? How did it go? You are fine with to ask me how it went. Blanche, you are fine with to sit here and kill him of it. Thank you, Alina and Karen. We now move on to our fourth group, and it is made up of Thomas Fong, Marvin Wang, and Kelvin Tam.
They will be playing a scene from the one-act play, A Night at the Inn. This play was written by Edward John Morton Ross Blunkett, otherwise known as Lord Dunsany, one of the oldest figures uh, in British and Irish literature. Briefly, the play deals with four sailors gathered at an inn on the moors. They have stolen the idol's eye, a treasure piece, and then they are about to get away with it. Now, this performance is directed by Year 12 IB Theatre student, Jasmine Harris. So let's give a big round of applause to our fourth group, Thomas, Marvin, and Kelvin. My candidate name is Marvin Wong, and I'm playing the role Jacob. My candidate name is Feng Chin Tong Thomas, I'm playing the role as Bill. My candidate name is Kelvin Tam Yun Kei, I'm playing the role as Albert. We're going to do a scene from the play, A Night at an Inn, by, written by Lord Dunsany. What is this idea, I wonder? I don't know. And how much longer will you keep us here? We've been here for three days. And I haven't seen a soul. And a pretty penny cost us here. <sighs> how long do you rent the pub for? You'll never know with her. <sighs> it's lonely enough. Oh, how long do you rent the pub for, Toffee? She's such a top, but yet she's clever, no mistake. Those clever ones are the ones to make a model. The plans are clever enough, but they never work. And they're, they, always, they always make a match much worse than you or me. Ah. I don't like this place. Why not? I just don't like the looks of it. He's keeping us here because those niggas can't find us. The free heathen priest will is looking for us, so... But we need to go and sell Ruby soon. Well, there's no sense in it. Why not, Albert? Because I gave him the slip in home. You gave them the slip, Albert? Yeah, the slip. All three of them. The doubles with the gold spots in their forehead. I had the Ruby then, and I gave him the slip. How did you do it, Albert? Well, I had the Ruby, and they were following me. Oh. How did they know you had the ruby? You didn't show it? Um, but they, they kind of know. But they kind of know, Albert? And, and they sort of know when you got the ruby. Well, well, they sort of mooshed after me. So I run and tell the policeman, and he says, Oh, they're only three poor niggers and wouldn't hurt me. <sighs> and I thought of what they did in Malta. It's poor old Jim. Yes, to George in Bombay before we started. <sighs> But why didn't you give him the charge, Albert? What about the ruby, Bill? Ah. Well, I did better than that. I walked up and down through a hall, and I walked slow enough. And then I turned a corner, and I ran. I didn't even seize a corner, but I turned it anyways. Hint. Sometimes I let a corner pass, you know, just to fool with them. I twisted about like a hare. Then I sit and wait. No priest. What? No heathen devils with the gold spots in their forehead. I gave him the slip. Well done, Albert. Why didn't you tell us? Because she won't let you speak. She's got her plans and thinks we're silly folk. And all this time, I gave him the slip? Might have one of them crooked knives in her. But for me, who gave him the slip in hole? Well done, Albert. Do you hear, Toffee? Albert has given them the slip. Yes, I hear. Well, what do you say to that? Uh, well done, Albert. So, what are you gonna do? I'm going to wait. Doesn't seem to know what she's waiting for. Uh, it's a nasty place. It's getting silly, Bill. We're running out of money and we need to sell our ruby. Let's get on to a town. But she won't come! Then we'll leave her! We'll be alright if we keep away from home. We'll, we'll go to London. But she must have her own fair share. All right, let's go. Do you hear that, Toffee? Give us the ruby now. Certainly. Come on, Jacob. 
Goodbye, old man. We will give you your fair share. But there's nothing to do here. No girls, no horse. And we need to sell a ruby soon. I'm not a fool, Bill. No, no, of course you ain't. You help us a lot. Goodbye. And you say goodbye? Oh, yes, goodbye. Oh, Toffee, we fall oh. back. So you have. How, how did they get here, Toffee? They walked, of course. But, but it's 80 miles. D did you know they were going to be here? Oh. Expected them about now. 80 miles! Oh, Toffee, old man. What are we going to do now? Ask Albert. If they can do things like this, there's no one can save us. But you, Poppy. I always knew you were a clever one. We won't be fools again. We'll obey you, Poppy. Thank you. Our fifth excerpt will be performed by Kitty Guo. Um, and it, they, she will be playing a scene from the play uh, Pretty Girl Playing Girl by Lindsay Price. Briefly, this play is uh, about a girl, a plain girl, who wants to win in a beauty pageant. The pretty girl, meanwhile, is more interested in finding her friend rather than spend her time with her boyfriend. And here's a scene where the two girls meet for the first time. And this scene will be directed by year 12 IB Theater student, Cece He, who will also be playing the role of plain girl. Candidate named Kitty Guo Jia Qi playing the role of Tara in a scene from the play Pretty Girl Slash Plain Girl by Lindsay Price. My name is Sissy, and I'll be playing the role of Jane. Uh, <laughs> um, hi! What? It, it, is this the registration desk for the um, Galaxy Girl pageant? Uh, is this the registration desk for the Galaxy Girl pageant? Uh, what if it is? I, I would like to register. You? Yes, yes. You want to be in the pageant? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, what's so funny? Oh, what do you think you're doing? Um, registering for the Galaxy Girl pageant? You can't register. Oh. Oh, why not? Look at you. Oh. Uh, what? It's obvious. Look. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, I, I, I still don't see why it's... Look at the difference between us. I'm clearly a 10. You're clearly a, a 2. 10s <gasps> and a beauty pageant? 2s don't. Now get out. <gasps> Jane, Jane, are you OK? Oh, that was too much. I told you that was too much. See, I told I, you. I, I, I'm fine. I just um, need to sit down, you know. You can't go crush like that. A pageant girl sees that look on your face and she's going for the kill. Don't really be that mean. Well, I was just getting started. Oh. See, you're not ready yet. I am. I am. You are doing the right thing, and I need to be prepared. So, oh, let's start over again. Let's. Uh, no, I still don't understand why you need to do this at all. I, I told you. Yeah, but it doesn't get any less crazy the more you say it. I want to be a girl. Uh, you said you are a girl. A girly girl. Trust me, it's no great shame. Just once. A girly girl. I know it's not in my future, so I want to make sure it happens. Wow, so sounds crazy. Uh, can't you just, um, go to prom? Get a nice dress, I'll do hair, 
I've been nominated for prom queen. But a beauty pageant? They'll humiliate but you. I can't take that. Oh, no, you can't. You don't have a thick skin. Oh, if I practice enough, I can make it tougher. Oh, I am ready. Insult me again. I can't. I can't see that look on your face. Well then, I guess I'm going to practice my walk. Ugh, I can do this. Thousands of girls enter beauty pageants. Oh, oh, yeah, and thousands don't. Don't you have a date? Huh? Tonight. Huh? Oh, I canceled. Oh, but why? Uh, because you asked me to help you. Oh, but you had a date. Well, I was just going to watch Dean and Frick and Frank watch basketball. Trust me, I can't do that any time. Won't well, Dean get mad? Well, he'd better not. He's not that special. Oh, don't you love him? Oh, sure. Uh, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't worry about it. Tara, <clears throat> you are not normal. Why? You canceled on your boyfriend instead of me. You're supposed to, you know, dump me for a guy. Oh, you're supposed to dump me, period. Dump you? How? You know, you'll talk to me a little less and a little less. And you'll stop talking to me altogether. You won't even look at me in the halls. It will be like we never are friends. That's ridiculous. Celine doesn't think so. When did you? In the bathroom on the second floor. I was in the stall when you guys came in and I heard what she said. I'm plain, <laughs> boring, not worth hanging out with. And did you hear what I said? I stood up for you. You should have come out. We could have stood up to her together. That's the point. She's popular and pretty. I am going to be a scientist in the future. And that's as far away from pretty as it gets. You can't hover in the middle. You have to pick a side. Well, then you, you think I would pick her over you? It's not your fault. It's the way things have worked since the beginning of time, you know? Whoa, crap! What's up, oh, crap? Oh, watch out! Oh. Oh. Are you okay? I, uh, I, I think the heels won. Take those stupid things off! Oh. 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 I think I did some damage there. Do you want to stay on the floor or go to your chair? Chairs! Oh, thank you. Oh. Oh. I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but I don't do what Celine tells me. What if she stops being your friend? Well, then I guess she wasn't worth it to begin with. Tara, you're not supposed to think for yourself. You are totally abnormal. So, what are you saying? If you were pretty and I was playing, you would dump me as a friend? <laughs> no! I, um, maybe. I, I don't think so. I don't know. Well, look, if you're going to do this, just do it, okay? Just don't spare my feelings and rip that friendship off like a band. <sighs> well, sorry to disappoint you, but... Oh, you really did a number on this. How am I going to compete in the pageants? You don't have to. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what the least. I don't care. You are real flat. But everyone else would be in heels. Oh, you know, there are these flat in Stanbrooks. I saw them last week. Pointy toe thing, sort of pink, sort of mauve. Very pretty. They'll look great on you. We can go tomorrow if you like. What about Dean? Well, they won't fit, but I'm sure it will look pretty on him, too. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> too bad. Okay, flat it is. Thank you. Our sixth group will be performed by, um, uh, it's made up of Alice Zhao and Penny Zhang. Uh, and they are going to be doing a scene from Arthur Miller's play, All My Sons. All My Sons is based on a true story about a businessman who narrowly avoided financial ruin by shipping cracked machine parts to the military. He blames his business partner and builds an empire, but this deed comes back to haunt him. Um, uh, in this scene, we meet Anne Deaver, who has been summoned to the Keller house 
because Chris has asked for her hand in marriage. We also meet Sue Bayliss, a friend of the Keller family. Here, now we see Sue confronting Anne about her resentment towards Chris, thus revealing to Anne that their neighbors all think that Joe Keller is guilty of the crime. Here now are our candidates, Alice and Penny. Candidate name, Penny Jen Jen Yutong. I am playing the role of Anne. Candidate name, Alice Diao An Si, and I'm acting Sue. Um, we are playing a scene from All My Songs, written by Awesome Lord. It's my husband. Oh, 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 I'm terribly sorry. It's all right. I'm just a little silly about the dark. It's getting dark. Are you looking for a husband? Oh, as usual. He spent so much time there. Then we told him rent. Nobody was just so he drove over to the depot to pick up my brother. Oh, your brother said? Yeah, they are to be here any minute now. Will you have some cold drink? I will. Thanks. <sighs> My husband. Too hot to drive me to the beach. Men sound like little boys. For the neighbors, they will always cut the grass. People like to do things for the killers. Been the way since I can remember. It's amazing. I guess so brothers to come in to give you away. Hmm? I don't know. I suppose. Well, you must be honored of. It's always a problem getting yourself married, isn't it? Mm, that depends on your shape, of course. I don't see why you should have a problem. I have chances. I have a bet. It's romantic. It's very unusual to me. Marrying the brother of your sweetheart. I don't know. I think it's mostly that whenever I need somebody to tell me the truth, I've always thought of Chris. When he tells you something, you know it's so. He will less with me. And he's got money. That's important, you know. It will matter to me. You'll be surprised. It makes all the difference. I married an intern on my salary. And that was bad. Because as soon as a woman supports a man that he owes her something, you will never owe somebody without resenting them. That's true, you know. And then this, I think the daughter is very devoted. Oh, certainly. But it's bad when a man always sees bars in front of him. Jim thinks he's in the jail all the time. Oh. That's why I've been intending to ask you a small favor, Anne. It's something very important to me. Certainly, if I can do it, you can. Will you take up housekeeping? trying to find a place away from here. Are you fooling? I'm very serious. My husband was very happy with Chris around. How's that? Jim is a successful doctor, but he's got an idea he likes to do medical research, discovering things you see. Well, isn't that good? Research paid $25 minus laundry t-shirt. You got to give him a life to go into it. How does Chris... Oh, Chris makes people want to be better. That is impossible to be. He does that to people. Is that bad? My husband has a family, dear. Every time he has a session with Chris, he feels as though he's not compromising by not giving up everything for research. As though Chris or anybody else isn't compromising. It happened with Jim every couple of years. He met the man and made the study out of him. Maybe he's right. I don't mean that Chris is a star, but now darling, you know he's not right. I don't agree with you, Chris. Let's face it, dear. Chris is working with his father, isn't he? He's taking money out of the business every week in the year. What of it? You ask me what of it? I certainly do. You are not cast as persons like that. I'm surprised at you. You were surprised at me. He never take five cents out of that plant if there was anything wrong with it. You know it. I know it. I resent everything you have said. You know what I resent, dear. Please, I don't want to argue. I resent living next to the Holy Family. 
It makes me look like a bum, you understand? I cannot do anything about that. Who is he to ruin some man's life? Everybody knows Joe's put a fast one to get out of jail. This is not true. Then why don't you go and talk to people? Go on, talk to them. There is no person in the block who doesn't know the truth. That's a lie. People come here all the time for cousin. So what? They give him credit for being smart. I do too. But if Chris wants people to put off the hair shirt and put on the bra clothes, it drives my husband crazy with a phony idolism. And I'm at the end of my rope on it. Oh, oh, hello, darling. How's mother? Thank you, Alice and Penny. And now we call on our final group, uh, made up of our candidates Virginia Low, Melody Ng, and Angelina Lee. And they will be doing a play, a uh, scene from the one act comedy, The Mistress of Wholesome, written by Jacob Appel. Um, the Gwen, the mistress, surprises Margaret, Leland's wife, and holds her hostage. According to Gwen, Margaret's husband Leland has now fallen back in love with Margaret as a couple got closer in their efforts to adopt a baby. Gwen, who is put out by this, demands that Margaret convince Leland to fall back in love with her so that things can be the same. Things get more complicated when Connie, the lady from the adoption agency, arrives to interview Margaret and Leland as potential parents. This excerpt is directed by Year 12 theater student, Michelle Lau. So let's now uh, give a big round of applause to our scene from The Mistress of Wholesome. My name is Lee Hume Angelina. I'm playing the role of Connie Keller. My name is Vir Lo Wen Chi Virginia, and I'm playing the role of Margaret Claypool. My name is Melody Ng-Checkling. I'm doing the role of Gwen from, a, from, the scene, from the scene of the play, The Mistress of Wholesome by Jacob Appel. That's her! Don't answer it. Like how I'm not going to answer it. I swear I'm gonna shoot. Coming. You don't seem to understand. I'm nearly 40 years old. I gave up teaching three years ago when we started trying the fertility treatments. My husband is a philanderer ambassador who can't keep an appointment. If they don't give me this baby, it won't matter to me if you shoot me. Some a threat? It's just a friendly observation, dear. You need me, and I'm your only hope of ever getting the land back. So, will you help me? Just a moment. I haven't decided yet. How far away are you from? Practically across town. I couldn't find space. Why? Then we'll have to make do without the land. And give me that. <coughs> Try to look innocent. Play. 
man is still kept food. Is there much crime in this neighborhood? It's a trick I learned from my mother. If you leave food in the safe with a warm welcome in lost, sometimes they be still guilty to do anything. That's rather eccentric, don't you think? Oh, heavens no. God, because I wouldn't want to leave baby double with that awful. Of course you wouldn't. It was just a joke about welcoming the burglars. There's no garbage on in this neighborhood. Not at all. I just lock up the food so Nilan can get to it. Otherwise, he's filled with his pocket with full of cannolis. Is your husband impulsive? Yes. No. What my sister mean is that my husband hmm. often is impulsive, but he really acts up. What I mean is, is he a soft man who will sell a baby in the black market? Are you trying to buy one? It's crazy. Please ignore my sister. And I assure you, whatever you heard about my husband, he is the embodiment of integrity. It's certain. It's not a cable, a soft man who cheated on his wife. Support her own mistresses, and in order to sell and adopt a baby in China, in order to sell in the black market. <laughs> There's no need to cry, dear. It's upsetting. I'm sorry. I had bad experience. I'm on probation. <laughs> Ow! Oh! Have any clear, honey? Nothing like cholesterol to cheer you up. I love what I do, Mrs. King. You're probably much better than you think. No, I'm not! I'm really not! If I screw up one more time, I'll, I'll have a job! That's right, dear. Let it all out. You don't understand! I grew up in the orphanage. And I remember the day I turned 18. They sent me out of the world all alone. I worked for my college and social work school. And finally, I landed my dream job, family service. And when I had a chance to hang up a photograph in my office, my first placement ends up in the black market. Which is why I'm not going to take any change this time. My next placement will be perfect. Then you have come to the right place, Connie. Where is the most wholesome family you ever met in your life? I'm the mistress of wholesome. In high school, I was voted the most wholesome girl in the senior class. Two years in a row. We're all very wholesome. I think that's what Leland likes about me, that I'm so wholesome. Uh, Leland and my sister have a very close relationship. <clears throat> Intimate. How nice. So not many people can get along with their in-laws. Leland and my sister are unusual in a way, but not too unusual. It's far more common than you think. Is there any weapons in this house? Vegas, grenades, baskets, guns? Is that really not? <laughs> So how about all those points of hands? Mm. We are doing a spring inventory work, Li Gwen. Uh, yeah, um, we have um, 19 pots of um, 12 pans, two sets of earrings, and nothing to eat. All of this makes me nervous. Hydrate is half had later. You know, cleanliness is godliness. Are there any more pastries stuck in that safe? For God's sake, Gwen! Uh, for God's sake, I'm so glad you are here with me this afternoon, so we can show how much we love each other. When do you expect Dr. Cable to return home? I honestly don't know. There's a possibility that he might not make it at all. You know, saving lives and all that in the hospital. I thought you said he was having car trouble. Uh, cardiac trouble. They're trying to 
fix a broken heart, but it wasn't going so well. Well, never mind. I suppose I should come next time to meet Dr. K. Can't you just approve us based on the visit? I'm afraid I couldn't do that. Oh, do you think the neighbors would let me use their phones if I ask for more pastries? It's any squirrel with the telephones. Yeah. It's just some problem with the lines, nothing major. Well, it sure won't hurt, wouldn't it? The worst they can do is say no. Can't you just approve them? Okay, uh, that concludes and now, uh, our performances. We now call on all of our students to take their final bow and, and their directors on stage. Can we now call on our performers? Come on, candidates. And we thank you so much for coming tonight. And we hope to see you um, late February for our final uh, showcase. All candidates, please. So we can take uh, a group bow. And... Wait, wait. And group bow, go. A big round of applause to our candidates. Uh, we'd like to say thank you also to the assistance provided by the Wednesday CCA. Uh, they are doing the backstage work here and also sounds and lights. Uh, and a big thank you to our AV team, Davey, Raymond, and Ease. Thank you so much for recording this. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.